This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Cyber Frontier show number 11, recorded on October 27th, 2014. Here on Cyber Frontiers, we explore cybersecurity, big data, and technologies that are shaping the future, all from an academic perspective. I'm your host, Jim Collison, broadcasting live from the AverageGuy.tv studios here in Bellevue, Nebraska. And of course, we post the show with world class show notes only because these guys do the show notes out at the AverageGuy.tv. If you have questions, comments, or contributions, you can contact me. Send me an email, Jim at the AverageGuy.tv. Of course, you can find me on Twitter, and many of you have. Although, Christian's Twitter is catching up quickly, so that we can talk about that at the end of the show. At Jay Collison, or now call in those questions, 402-478-8450. Leave a message. We'll play the question right here on the show. It's a great way to get your questions in. All right, joining me tonight from the Security Fortress, that is the University of Maryland College Park, and sporting his red Maryland gear, Christian Johnson. Christian, how are you? Hey, I'm doing good, living the life of Terrapin Pride, as, as mentioned. Uh, things are going well. We find ourselves as CS majors just um, taking that, that momentary breath after the end of first midterms as we then realize that the way they have designed our CS curriculum, we get to prepare for our second midterms only three weeks after the first ones were over. So what the word mid really means is kind of a lost definition in my book at this point. But other than no, that, we're doing really true, right? <laughs> Yeah, but we're, we're doing well and charging forward. Good, good, good to, good to see you again. And then, of course, over to his left, literally, I think, <laughs> behind, behind him. Yeah. Behind him, right? Yep. Uh, Ashton Webster. Ashton, how are you? I'm doing well. Also glad to be done with my first round of midterms. And if I'm in a good mood tonight, it's because I'm passing all of my uh, public tests for my programming assignment. So that's nice. always a satisfying uh, goal to have reached. Ashton, and, behind you, we've been watching the cereal boxes grow oh, yeah. over the last couple of podcasts. So, so tell me what's going on back there real quick. So uh, I'm trying to think which ones we added. We added a bunch because we had finished a lot of things this week. So we have like we have some more granola bars and maybe Cheerios and stuff like that. And what's it going to um, do? When it's, are you just throwing them on the wall or is it going to do something when you're done? I mean, they're not going to dance or anything. They're just going <laughs> to stay there. I, the reason why we did that is because people will walk into my room and for like two or three weeks, we didn't have anything up here. So it'd be like, oh, you should put up like pictures of your family or, um, you know, you should decorate in some way. And I'm like, well, I don't have anything to decorate with. <laughs> so I just put up the, uh, the covers. Up the cereal box. Well, it's and always good to see the inside mind of a college student. And, indeed. Uh, and what yeah. art is indeed. So very cool. Welcome. Well, if you're, if you're a regular to the show and you're out on the live page, either live uh, or live too, um, Christian and I have effectively broken the chat room uh, over the last uh, weekend. I paid twenty-five dollars for Christian to buy the SSL certificate so we could up update uh, the average guy TV to be fully encrypted. And uh, so, if you go out there now, you'll notice. Look at the, look up there in the URL. Just look. It says HTTPS up there. And so, uh, that, really, all that means, uh, Christian, is that the NSA is not listening anymore, right? Is that well, that, I why? don't know if it means that, but it means. <laughs> so. Well, I figured I'll take anybody who will listen to this podcast, even the NSA, if they want to sneak, if they want to sneak in and listen to it, they would be more than welcome. But we spent a little time, Christian, talk about that upgrade real quick. Yeah, so we went and covered this on a previous episode of Cyber Frontiers and also on Home Gadget Geeks about the implementation method that I have been kind of rolling out on an as-needed basis with the services I've been running. And we're using an incredibly uh, low-cost, affordable uh, certificate from Komodo that is sold through one of the resellers um, through the Namecheap.com brand. And that allows us to get a five-year certificate for 25 years. So I popped that on at the Apache servers. Yeah. yeah 20, 20, 20. Or, 20. Sorry, yeah, 25 <laughs> for five years. So it's like five years. <laughs> sorry. Higher level math. And um, and so I just, you know, generated our certificate signing uh, receipts and had those certificates signed over. And I'm turning on sites with HTTPS as needed. And that's both for the security value and also because... Um, HTTPS is now given slight preference in Google search rankings. So, and I've actually been able to measure and verify this is the case. Um, the site uh, that many of you know I run, biostashmods.com, took a very nice uptick in uh, Google Webmasters after the migration.
registration was complete, and I'm seeing about 4,200 click-throughs per day on Google, which is up from about the 3,800 it was hovering around before the implementation. So I want to say that's attributed to HTTPS, but um, that remains to be seen. So, All right. Very cool. Well, so... Uh, it's all set, all secure. Give it a try. We broke the we broke chat wing. We're gonna we're gonna have to fix that, or uh, maybe have to pay some premium. So we'll we'll get that fixed. Everything else, I think. If you do notice anything on the site, let me know. Uh, Jim at theaverageguy.tv. All right, let's dig in. Ashton, uh, why don't you take a second and introduce our guest? Yeah, so you might have noticed we have a a special guest tonight. His name is Jay Ellis, and uh, he's at the at Stinger Gafarian Technologies with me. He is a, he goes by many names, the senior staff manager, um, security evangelist, or senior security officer, what have you, um, and he's here to talk about his experiences and share some stories with us, so uh, should be a good time. Hi, Jay. Great. Thank you very much, Ashton. Uh, good to be here, guys. Yeah, so just to, just to interject, um, it's pretty cool to actually see three people who have managed to be affiliated with SGT in some capacity and uh, get together to talk. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the name, SGT is the second largest shared service provider for uh, NASA as a contracting firm. And so they're a very um, strong, uh, medium-sized business, I would say, about 2,000 employees now on contract and then corporate, and they do a variety of contracting services from the federal government, ranging to NASA, NOAA, um, etc. So, uh, really great to have Jay on, and Jay has had a significant amount of program management experience both both at SGT and previous positions. So we really wanted to take a deep dive to uh, pick your brain tonight about some of the things that you've had hands-on experience with and what the challenges are that you've seen both the data side and the security side. So um, we're looking forward to having that conversation. So. Let's go ahead and dive right in if you're okay with it. Um, why don't you just Absolutely. give us a... Sounds good. Yeah, perfect. So can you give us a brief overview of what you're currently doing in your role at SGT and what your program management responsibilities are? Sure. Thanks a lot. Uh, actually, let me talk a little bit about what brought me to SGT. You mentioned uh, some of the um, experience I've had prior to SGT. Uh, actually, one of the main business development folks at SGT uh, is a woman by the name of Phyllis Kay, who was the president of Advance Med, was a Medicare contractor that I worked for from 2003 to 2013. I was the SSO there. Uh, I was there while they grew from about 250 to 600 people. They were managing about a third of the Medicare claims all around the United States. Uh, had a you know very substantial data warehouse uh, that we needed to. Uh, um, maintain as well as, you know, keep secure. And, uh, and so Phyllis came to SGT a couple years ago, and uh, that's who I was my introduction to SGT. So I've only been there about a year, uh, but my experience, I think you guys have probably more experience in at least a number of years working with SGT than I do. Um, but it's certainly a, a, a very dynamic environment, like you said, a lot of very good, uh, high-talented individuals working at, at Goddard, a variety of different places around uh, the country for NASA. Um, and specifically at NASA, what I'm doing now, a um, contract called SGSS, which stands for uh, Systems uh, Grounds. It's actually the ground systems for all of NASA's um, TDRS satellites. It's a constellation of satellites uh, that is used to basically be like a telephone network for space. So it used to be in the old days before NASA had uh, this constellation of sat satellites, as spacecraft or rockets would go up, they would actually lose communication with the ground systems for a period of time. And uh, um, so in order to, to remedy that, NASA put up this constellation of satellites that would allow a re – that's why it's called TDRS, um, tracking data and re relay system, and actually relays the data between all these satellites and ensures that the spacecraft will basically have 100% communication uptime uh, while they're in space. Um, so what, I, what they're now doing is these um, sys ground systems um, – SGSS is actually the name of the system, um, and this actually stands for uh, the, the ability to have all the systems on the ground uh, and to completely refurbish them because they've been, you know, VMS, VAXs, all sorts of different systems that uh, for, you know, uh, 20, 30 years have maintained the same type of technology, and they really want to upgrade that and obviously do it in a secure fashion. So they, uh, they put together a, um, a big plan. It's actually a contract that uh, General Dynamics is the, the prime contractor out in Phoenix. 
and uh, so I'm, I'm part of the, the GD team um, uh, to, or the oversight team for NASA that is taking a look at all the work that the GD is doing to ensure that it is uh, doing so in a, a way that's going to be uh, compliant with NIST 853 uh, and all of uh, the guidelines that um, NASA also has put together. So, and that this is no small feat as well because a lot of these are non-IP type systems or RF, a lot of radio frequency uh, communications between the satellites and the ground systems and, and that's actually probably the biggest learning curve for me is, is everything that I've done in, in my career so far has been all related to your typical IP networking and this is a, a sure. rather big learning curve for me. But, uh, but it's really exciting and I think a lot of the same rules uh, related to uh, um, the you know the NIST 853 apply here, and so that's really my expertise that that they uh, they came into play and why why they brought me on board. So that's kind of an overview of what I've been doing, uh, and I'd be glad to dive into any uh, any parts of that if you guys have more questions. Sure. So uh, you know I'm personally curious on so SGSS obviously it's a no IP network, but I feel like not many. Not as many people would even think about what are the data transport mechanisms and what are the security vulnerabilities. So can you talk a little bit about how non-IP based transport mechanisms um, do a handshake protocol and whether how secure that actual communication is because obviously it's, you know, you're transmitting some band of data that could be intercepted, right, um, by hardware that's able to read those uh, frequencies. So can you talk a little bit about what types of security considerations go into that design process? Sure, and I'll, I'll talk as much as I can without um, sure. getting into the, the, the part of it that is um, uh, we need to have a secure enclave that goes above and beyond a, a FISMA high. So this is, by the way, a, a FISMA high system. Uh, but then there's another part of it that is... Uh, um, that deals with data for certain customers that is going to exceed that. So, um, so I think some of the proprietary technologies they're using to encrypt are the hardware, basically we'll call ComSec type capabilities, uh, and I think that's that's the part that really um, requires the the specialized handshaking uh, that is above and beyond, quite a bit different than your typical IP networking. So you know, it's it's not just having some you know a, a VPN with you know you know Cisco PIX or some other kind of devices that you're you know you have hardware firewalls that are matching on or, you know on either end of a, a, a network, but it is literally having you know these crypto devices on either end as well as on these satellites or as well as on the ground stations that are matching. That is a whole other set of technical challenges and ability to secure. Uh, than you'll need to do on a, on a typical, you know, all ground type system. And so, so that's, that's, sure, is the is the communication basically endpoint to endpoint encryption, or are we do we do we look at it more in terms of a network where you know, hey, I have this address, this MAC address, etc., and if someone sends a broadcast packet, I'm going to receive and answer that, or is it more of just a you need to almost like a private key architecture for each networked communication point that, you know, you give me this token, and if this token matches, I'll send you back a reply. I mean, I think it's very expensive to do that kind of um, right. key exchange all over the place, and I think that's in a perfect world. Um, that's what NASA would like to achieve to do, but I think what they need to do is also realize that bandwidth, especially between satellites and the expense of having really, really fat pipes and the amount of data that they they want to ship down for things like mapping and and a, and a lot of the you know uh, very large data um, you know, uh, that is becoming very prevalent with with satellite technology um, is just very very uh, cost prohibitive and really un uh, almost impossible to do in the time frames that they need to achieve. So I think it's uh, it's kind of a blend of the two from what I've seen so far. And again, mm -hmm. I, like I've only been there ten months. Uh, but that's what I've seen is that where they can do what you talked about in the, um, the private key exchange for everything we're attempting to do, but that can't be universally done simply because of the, the technology limitations at this point and, and the lack of the um, available bandwidth with uh, the, the kind of you know, technology that is out there today for satellite communications. You also mentioned that there's some fundamental differences between the radio frequency networks that we're working with now and the IP networks that you're familiar with. Um, or can you go into a little bit of detail as to what makes those ch more challenging and what, what the differences are there? I would say it's mainly the the bandwidth. Um, and, I mean, we're still talking in, in you know, 
in K versus megabyte and giga, gigabyte. You know, that's the, the first thing that struck me very odd when I got and saw a lot of the documentation for, oh yeah, we have this amount of K, and I, and I was like, what, what year is this we're talking about? You know, so it's, uh, but that's the reality, and, and a lot of the data that they're receiving down is for the satellite um, telemetry data, which is not necessarily pictures or, you know, video or things like you'd see that the International Space Station is 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 sending down, but it is more what position is this satellite? What is it? You know, what is the vector that it's uh, um, that it's you know uh, you know proceeding on? Is it on the correct path to be able to intercept the you know to 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 make it to the International Space Station if it, that's what it's doing? Um, and that kind of data is is very very small. It's just you know numeric for the most part. Um, and so that, that smaller bandwidth RF type capabilities is absolutely fine for that. And so that's used primarily for that kind of uh, communications. But then you get into the real world Google Maps and uh, high res photography that is getting you know, so prevalent. Um, and that's where that's kind of disappearing and they're having to do, it, it really is approaching. I think they're, they did a laser demonstration that's up on that NASA site that they got, I think, um, 600 meg um, for for a test download speed, yeah, uh, and so that's really uh, the, the, that's opening up new frontiers. Even though it's it is, you have to be very very precise, and the uh, you you guys probably know more about this than I do, but it has to be a very very focused beam in order to be able to make that uh, occur, which is makes it very very difficult to do that with you know you know non stationary objects out in space, how many yeah, you know sure. mile hundreds of miles away, so. Um, but I think that's opening up new frontiers and, and is really uh, moving it more toward the kind of um, uh, IP networking and the speeds that I've seen. So, but I, I just in general, it's been more the speeds that it just seems to defy a lot of the um, the, the things that we normally accept in this day and age of uh, being present. And in terms of, I guess, the capabilities of this network, do you do you have any information on how it would compare on something like the EO, EOS DIS program that NASA runs for our um, Earth observing telemetry? I mean, are we talking similar era technology where, you know, it's the data is being streamed on a recurring recurring basis into a data silo that is shared between a couple different uh, DACs or distributed uh, active archive centers that are sharing and streaming this data all at the same time, or is it more just for end-to-end -end ground to satellite communications and the data doesn't persist over time? You know, I think it's a, a, um, a bit of a combination. You have some of the users at these um, uh, mocks, they call them, the mission uh, operations centers, which a lot of them are, um, are universities or other organizations that have a defined need, and they're paying NASA for, the, uh, for basically a service to be able to you know, have their satellite to be able to have this data streamed down back to their site. So there's there's a host of different customers that are helping fund this, you know, in, in the end. Um, and so I, I think there might be some customers that because of the volume of data that they have and the amount, it might fit the model of what you're saying. Um, but I think the majority of them from what I've seen are more, uh, you know, end users who are consumers of this service and are downloading the data for their needs, which so it's probably a lot smaller than the, um, uh, than the kind of data you're talking about. I'm sure it's out there and it's being used by NOAA and other folks like that just on this particular project. This sure. is more, like I said, just a, a net, kind of like a communications network for space and the, uh, um, uh, and the, and the ground systems for that. So, and actually SGSS is, it should really be named SNGSS. It's Space Network Ground Systems Segment Sustainment. And that is really what that stands for. That's the overall five-year modernization project. So. Gotcha. Um, so I want to transition a little bit. First, Ashton, do you have any other questions on SGSS you want to follow up on? I think we, we did the deep dive. Uh, I'm cool. ready to sort of transition into, um, you know, back, back down to earth, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I was at a very interesting uh, talk today with uh, Bill Fraser, who gave a lecture on some of the entrepreneurial challenges in kind of venture capital startups, Silicon Valley, 
where the market is working, where the markets are broken, etc. A very interesting talk, uh, very in-depth. One of the key things that struck out to me that he said uh, that I think a lot of people are, are agreeing with is that you know the healthcare market is going to be forced to change because the system is broken and not just from kind of a governance perspective but from an information uh, technology and security standpoint and so I really am fascinated by kind of your your experience and your background in all of the issues that pertain to that because that is such a huge area of j not only just the general market and economy but cybersecurity and and on, I'll, I'll be honest with you not as many people talk about it in my circles probably because my head is elsewhere um, but it's a huge issue of importance that there are a lot of problems we really haven't solved yet. Um, so it would be great if you could kind of give us an overview of how you how you entered into that market, what type of development work you did in the security pertaining to healthcare and IT systems, and what you foresee and and are seeing some of the existing challenges in that market being uh, apparent. Sounds great. Yeah, so I actually started um, sowing my oats as a, um, a, an ASP web developer and then a manager of, of you know, .NET developers and you know, 4GL tool developers. This was back in the 90s. Um, then a, a DBA of sorts and a manager of DBAs. And these were actually for, um, this actually for a disease management company uh, that was a subsidiary of Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield down in Richmond. It used to be called Trigon. And they basically had a staff of 80, and then it became hundreds and hundreds of nurses doing um, telephonic health care. Uh, not telemedicine, you might have heard of that, but this was more uh, um, a group of healthcare care professionals. Um, and they, this company would market their services to companies or large insurance companies to basically keep their people healthy and keep them out of the hospital. Um, and so I helped write IT systems and databases to capture all that data. Um, and to be able to allow them to have some, uh, um, some metrics, and they really started to collect a lot of this data and to be able to say, okay, what, well, what could predict this person's um, you know, uh, bad health coming in the future? And it gave rise to this whole disease management field. And so we kept a lot of the data. They determined what are the, the highest cost um, uh, diseases out there, asthma, diabetes, uh, CAD, CHF. Uh, and they would specifically target parts of the population and make um, phone calls to these folks to, to basically keep them healthy and keep them out of the uh, keep them out of the hospitals. Uh, so that became a really really big part of of, uh, of Trigon and now Anthem's um, campaign to be able to keep healthcare costs down. Very very positive and very proactive and and I thought it was a really good good model for that. So. I, uh, from there, I moved to be an employee of CSC, and Advanced Med was a subsidiary of CSC, and I moved into the Medicare space where I became a, um, a contractor to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, working on some of their fraud and abuse detection contracts. It was actually kind of sad that uh, I think it's seven or eight hundred um, billion dollars a year is the uh, the budget for Medicare right now, so it's a huge budget, uh, and they estimate almost thirty billion in fraud. Uh, uh, claims are, are processed every year. So they, they commit several hundred million dollars to contractors like I was working for to basically identify, detect, and prevent fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, and obviously to keep those systems, because you're looking for a lot of fraudulent doctors who are over-prescribing Oxycontin and doing things like that, uh, and to investigate and, uh, um, and, and keep these people from, from basically abusing the system, or from just over... Um, uh, over uh, submitting claims that are fraudulent. So a lot of the hospitals will then, or chains will go in and submit things and over exaggerate claims and make them seem a little more, um, you know, add on more types of services when they, you know, somebody isn't getting them. Uh, and so a lot of the work that uh, AdvanceMed did was to do a lot of analytics to determine, okay, this person is, is getting a lot of physical therapy, but they never had any kind of MRIs before. They never had any kind of services that you would expect to be indicative of why this person should have physical therapy. And it, or there, th this one mobile um, uh, MRI shop has been doing 15 MRIs a day for the past five weeks. Why is that? And it's because they're set up in a hospital part or a, a, a physician's parking lot that he's in coots with 
and is able to get them, every one of his patients, to go get an MRI, even though they don't really need it. So a lot of the analytics that Advanced Med did was to look at outliers and the type of uh, data that we collected and to be able to determine, you know, just, you know, to predict and to go after these folks who are obviously not submitting claims um, in, in an honest fashion and that, that, are, that were indeed fraudulent. Um, so that's the background of the business model of what Advanced Med did. And, and so as I said, it was about 250 people when we started, about 600 um, uh, when I, after, the, after 10 years of having worked with Advanced Med. And uh, the interesting thing is in 2012, CMS won the Cybersecurity Innovation Award for their continuous monitoring program. So I was there right in the heart of having to just start it out as me as the system security officer and working with a lot of the IT staff. And by the time I left, I had a team of four. Um, we had uh, devices in every one of our 10 offices that CMS had deployed. These were NCircle IP360 uh, continuous monitoring, um, you know, basically Nessus you know, vulnerability scanning type devices, which were feeding real-time information back to CMS and uh, scanning us on a sometimes daily basis, and then creating a, a monthly grade and, and report card, which would be fed to all of uh, our government officials to say, here's how you, this one particular contractor is doing. Uh, so I think I was mentioning this to Ashton that it was. Um, it was, it was before that happened, it was very, very difficult to, to convince management that, um, and program managers um, that we need to change the way we're doing business here. We need to invest in, you know, Nessus, you know, vulnerability scanning and patching tools and, 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 um, and really meet the FISMA guidelines. Um, and it wasn't until we had, um, you know, CMS knocking on our door and putting these devices in our, uh, our um, in every one of our offices and then getting scored by the government, uh, was I able to be successful in getting the kind of, um, you know, basically being able to make the kind of change that I knew as a security professional we needed to make. Um, but it wasn't until that time, until we had that kind of, you know, tangible outcomes um, that you were basically able to get to make management realize that we needed to make that change. So that was probably the, the biggest thing for us. And, and I mean, it was a success. I felt really good about the, the work that we did. Uh, we went from being a, uh, um, you know, folks who had a um, rudimentary scanning and patching that would, you know, do your typical Microsoft patch Tuesdays and maybe get everything into compliance within a month uh, to basically having all high patches, all high findings patched within seven to 10 days um, and we were a top A score uh, within the top 10% of CMS contractors by the time I left. So that was a huge culture change, as I said. Um, you know, sometimes you really need to, to shake up and, and, uh, um, and bring it to upper management and, and go over management's head to be able to make them realize those kind of changes need to, uh, to happen. But that uh, um, sometimes the, the old adage, you know, no pain, no gain, that, that certainly uh, applies in the information security field. And I, I certainly... I felt and found that um, numerous times throughout my engagement with, with Advanced Med. So, um, so was that a uh, was the motivation for that within the company, or was that a, a third party that did this monitoring through the the uh, these in-circle devices? That was actually CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid okay. Services. They bought 700 in-circle IP360 devices, and basically all of their largest contractors. Uh, and, and Advanced Med was one, they sent us an email saying, hey, guess what? You get to be part of the continuous monitoring program now. We're going to send you these devices next week. Uh, we'll have them send us your, um, your you know, Nessus scan of your entire environment, uh, enumerate all the devices in your network uh, and all of your subnets and, and every part of your network, and we'll configure these devices so you can just pretty much plug them in and, and, and let them run. Um, so that was actually CMS doing that. They actually had MITRE as their subcontractor um, working on site, working closely with us to be able to do the actual configuration and to basically be our in-house in tech support. Uh, but it was, it was CMS where those uh, devices were hosted, and we would actually go back to CMS's site to look at the results of these scans so that we could produce these reports and show them to our management as well, too. So. Yeah, that must have been helpful from a um, performance evaluation perspective because then you kind of got an idea. I mean, I imagine it would have helped to, to have an idea of how you were doing. Right. Yeah, not only that, I mean, it, from a performance, as far as performance of the network perspective, it was actually pretty 
difficult to to balance. We had our own internal NESA scanners as well as the IP360 scanners, and we had to make sure that they weren't scanning at the same time. Mm-hmm. Seemed like double work, uh, but that was. And then kind of interpolating the um, or interpreting the results between Nessus and and Circle was sometimes not exactly the same. So we would have mm-hmm. to. Uh, we'd have to try to figure out, well, why is, you know, why is this not exact? Why, you know, why, why is this finding showing up as a high in N-Circle versus it isn't in, uh, you know, um, in, in Nessus? And then sometimes we get zinged with a score even though Nessus didn't find it. So there are things like that that, uh, uh, but you're absolutely right. It gave us a concrete score that helped me to be able to go to management and I would do quarterly briefings to say we have. X number of findings. We have a B or a C or whatever the score was this month for this one particular office. Office. We need to get our act together here. We need to co- commit some resources. And so, as a, as an SSO, it certainly helped me to be able to do that. Um, it, it turned a lot of the IT people into you know patch management experts, and they probably didn't like me for having done that. Uh, but you know that's what they needed to do. And and then once they got the A score, then they owned it. And then they were like, you know what, this is great. We have an A now. This is really, really good. And so it really helped to turn them around once you got that. Getting them there, that was, um, that was pretty painful. And I was, you know, I was Dr. No for, for a long time, but I'm sure yeah. they you know, didn't like me. So. Sure. That's so one of, one of the questions out in chat um, pertaining is, what are some of the most noteworthy findings that this particular scanning device would give in its report that people said, oh, this is something we need to fix? Were there any, was there anything that typically popped out for individuals when they got, once they got these devices for the first time? Um, I think a lot of the, the older... Um, Persist. I can't remember any specific ones right now, but there are a lot of older persistent um, uh, patches that have not been applied. That there was basically there was no hiding anymore. And lots of times, if you couldn't do something like, you know, firmware upgrades, we had a couple, um, uh, uh, like SAN type devices, external SAN devices that were proprietary devices. We really couldn't upgrade the firmware, and Nessus would find these and flag it as a, this is an old firmware, or I can't find the signature for this type of device, and they would just flag it as an in, immediately hide finding because it looked like an old um, piece of firmware. So that, um, that, that was probably the worst, that we couldn't fix those, versus the typical Microsoft Patch Tuesday, things like that. It was just a matter of getting into a routine and having a good, solid patch management, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure in place and the people to be able to do that and the patch management tools. We had the semantics um, patch management platform that really helped us to be able to roll out the, the patches that without an automated um, management tool for rolling out patches, uh, it was pretty much impossible uh, to be able to achieve those. So that I, I think it's just finding those, the, the, those low-hanging fruit um, and sorry to be so nebulous, but that was, sure. uh, I think the, the firmware example was the one that was probably the worst. Sure. So were you able to sort of parse out the signal from the noise with those in terms of you had these uh, findings that were marked high but weren't necessarily the, the highest priority or not necessarily as bad as they were made out to be by these uh, different applications? And just in general, were there other examples of sort of just noise that... that you had had to filter through to get to the the real meat of the results. Yeah, I think those were the worst. The you know they if it didn't recognize the operating system, that it immediately flagged it and put it to a high. So things like that. Um, or if it was a you know something that was you, know, you hadn't patched it in X number of months. If it was a really old OS, you know the the very obvious things were those were pretty easy. It was just you know the volume of work to be able to. To, to, to get the environment, you know, um, you know, back up to snuff. So if it, if there were certain offices, and, and I think what, uh, what we were able to ferret out is that there were pockets of uh, this company's network that were, had been hiding and really hadn't been committing the resources that they needed to. Um, and this really uncovered that pocket and uh, made those program managers wake up when they didn't have to in the past. They, it kind of, the program managers, um, during that time had a lot of power over executive management because they were the ones who hold it all the, held all the purse strings for the money, for the contracts. So they were able to say, we need to please the customer. That's the most important thing. 
And by the end of this exercise, what you know, what they realize that we need to have a good score from our, you know, for our government customer to look at in the end circle before anything, and then we can go and, and try to keep our customers happy or keep keep management happy. And that right. that was a wake up call for them. So, sure. Um, one other follow-up question that we got about the um, what it was able to identify for the devices that were, you know, flagged as you know legacy, but we can't really update this firmware. Was there any type of containment procedure to continuously monitor them in a more proactive manner, or were they just something that became part of the IT security plan that the CISO would account for when doing record keeping? Well, you could do you could do both. We could actually have it as a, like a, a plan of action and milestone to say that this particular item, these particular servers can't be patched. We're setting a X number of you know week, month guideline, uh, which we need to fix that by that time. But you could also put exceptions in the Encircle tool, which was actually a nice part of it to be able to say, uh, don't generate a high finding because we've we've got the government to okay this for the time being. We have a POAM to be able to mitigate this right now. Um, and Encircle was able to say either by IP address or by some other flag to be able to say, ignore this and don't create a high finding every time. Otherwise, we'd have to go back in and, and uh, um, uh, it would negatively affect the score. If everything but that one particular device was patched and you could get an A score, but if you have any one device or a, um, a, a many devices that were out of compliance that could either one of those could drop your score pretty significantly by two letter grades very very easily. Yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at with the signal and the noise question. Um, mm. Just wondering if you could configure it so that uh, apparently you can configure the, the the those monitoring services so that they aren't generating these these high high findings for things that are uh, for the time being not the highest priority. Correct, but we would have to get the approval. Right, from, right. So you'd have to go and, right. and so, have a plan for them, but um, they at least wouldn't be distracting from the, the 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 high findings that actually needed immediate action. Exactly, and actually, but since Miter was the 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 company who was in charge of of uh, maintaining those tools, in order to add any exceptions, they were the ones who had, had to approve doing that, so that it wasn't just us. Mm -hmm. Being able to, you know, grant ourselves exceptions, and that's right. so we would have to have we'd have weekly meetings with the team, and we'd have to say, yes, we're on top of those servers. Here's the issue. You see, we have a, a POAM item for the for these. Could you please put an exception in there for for these particular devices? So yeah, the tool was it was granular enough and had enough capability to be able to do that that we were able to. Um, and then we were basically getting graded on the rest of our infrastructure instead of always getting dinged for those two. Sure. So yeah, it did a pretty good job of doing that. So can you give us a bit of a time frame on, I guess, when IP360 first kind of hit the hit the production um, pipeline, and at that point in time, uh, was or is IPv6 a technology that the IP scanner was aware of and capable of handling um, in the network, or was it an IPv4-based device? Now, it was pretty much all IPv4 uh, for what we were responsible for at that time. Um, and so this was around, um, I, I think, 2008, 2009, uh, when we first started um, the, that CMS was ramping up their, their uh, cybersecurity and especially the continuous monitoring program. Uh, and then that's when we, I got successively three different ATOs in 2010 through 2012 for these different systems. And then right along with that would be the continuous monitoring. So it was probably around 2011 when it was in full swing. Um, and, but you know, throughout that time and even through 2013, it was all still IPv4. Gotcha. And do you foresee IPv6 taking over that particular, I mean, do you think... Do you think medical networks will be faster or slower to implement IPv6 than the federal government compliance standards have been? Well, it's interesting. I think uh, healthcare, like you alluded to, has always been behind in a lot of this, um, and a lot of whether not only just security, but just in IT in general. Um, and I think um, so. I can't imagine that they would lead in this, especially given the. The lackluster, you know, adoption of a lot of you know, technology that I've seen, in, you know, in the past. So uh, um, I would think it's probably going to, you know, 
it's going to be slow to come along. Um, but if there is a, a security basis that could give the ability to, to have them avoid things like, you know, um, you know, compromise like the VA had, um, then I would think that that could certainly be a driver for, for them to be able to uh, adopt you know, a technology like that. Yeah, incidentally, I've, um, one contract that I worked on for the VA for um, another customer um, since I worked for Advanced Med uh, led me to find out that the VA is actually now in putting in a lot of their RFPs um, uh, to, to require encryption of data at rest. And this is even for data centers. So not, I mean, I think there's a couple different definitions you, when people talk about data at rest, uh, I look at data at rest as being, you know, data that's in your data center that is never going to move any place, not, not electronically moving, but is, you know, data on a laptop or on a, a iPad or something like that, even though it may not be moving, um, you could take that device and easily take it out of a protected space. And now, so I, I call that data that is not at rest. Sure. Uh, but what the, what the VA has done is said, we want data at rest, data that's in your data center encrypted as well, because you never know if you have an insider threat who might be able to compromise that. So that's so that's VA having gone from that breach where they spent you know twenty thirty million dollars on recovering from somebody having you know, taken a laptop and a hard drive and left it in their car and it got stolen, to now kind of going full scale the other way. They have one of the most widely adopted PIV implementations for a lot of their, than of any federal government agency. And now they're even putting that kind of um, you know, technology requirements into some of their RFPs. So that's, uh, and they do have a fairly substantial with the whole VA health system. So I think when you see security uh, incidents like that, forcing a culture change in an agency, um, then those are the kind of things that I think can really drive behavior change and, and adoption of technologies such as IPv6. So it very well might happen, but unfortunately some, something like the VA security breach might have to happen or some other um, episode that would, that would have a high up government official wanting to commit the funds to do that because it's, it's not cheap to do that. Sure. And they have to be able to justify that expense and not just to say because NIST and FISMA says – you know, there has to be some cost benefit uh, for that. So, yeah, and I took a course last semester that was really interesting on the subject of economics of cybersecurity, right. and it's kind of just what you touched on. The only way that you're guaranteed funding for the next uh, quarter or year or whatever it may be is t tends to be when there's a breach. That's when you can almost guarantee that there's going to be a lot of interest and a lot of funds dedicated towards the fixing the problem, um, and it's kind of a kind of an ironic thing because the, the, a lot of times the damage has already been done, um, but it is, you know, I mean, a lot of times it gets fixed, it's just too late. So, uh, and you, you kind of touched on this before, in addition to, it, it's difficult to make the case a lot of time, the business case for, you know, this is what the the bottom line is for implementing these cybersecurity measures to, to prevent the, the it's, it's really preventing the loss and re reducing the risk of the loss. Um, which is a challenging case to make in a lot of situations like that. Right. No, I completely agree, and that's why I would, when I started getting a lot of those metrics from the IP360 devices, or even before then, I, I would be tracking things like here's the number of open, you know, plan of action and milestone items that I was tracking, saying we have these number of servers that are not yet patched, or we're this part of our infrastructure that isn't, you know, upgraded yet that it should that it should be. Uh, results from prior audits that had not been remediated. All those things I would put into a spreadsheet and I put into a, a report and show that to management uh, quarterly to say, here's the number of outstanding findings that, that we have. The government isn't here yet with these devices in our network. This was a couple years before the Encircle IP360 devices were installed. I said, but they're coming. And when they come, there's going to be no more hiding. So now's the time we need to prepare for that. And the interesting thing is, is the, the contracting officer representatives, the cores or COTARs, I think they come by a couple different names, um, a lot of them don't want to have anything to do with information security. They want to get their programs funded. That They want to, you know, the work that we were doing, fraud, waste, and abuse detection. They have their, their budget to manage. They have their contractors that they need to, um, to, to, to detect and prevent fraud and abuse. Um, 
and they don't have money with the budgets that they have unless they get an infusion of capital from somebody higher up at, you know, in the government to be able to implement security. So that we're, we were caught between um, the security team and MITRE and the independent security wing working for the government uh, and the people funding all of our contracts who really didn't want to talk to the security folks because they knew they were just going to increase the cost of their contracts. Um, and so we had to find a way to justify in a politically correct way to um, our contracting officer representatives that you guys need to increase the budgets. You guys need, need to find a way to go get your budgets increased to be able to properly fund security. Um, and so we were able to go back to them and say, you know, all this work that you required us to do to put all these devices um, in, our, in, in, our, in our networks, um, and I kept track of all the hours. You said that MITRE was just going to, we were going to send them all of our IP addresses and uh, just plug them in. I kept track, and it was about 2,000 hours between all the different network teams. And uh, Oh, and by the way, you also want us to do uh, configuration management um, uh, scanning and to be able to make sure we're not just patching, but we also have configuration compliance too. Well, if that's the case, we need to buy a whole other security suite. So we ended up going back to the government, and I think uh, we got about a half a million dollars in extra wow. funding to be able to do that, um, simply because we we kept track of all this stuff that they were asking us to do, and you know, MITRE and the security departments within the, the government would be happy to you know continue us to give us more requirements, but they weren't the ones funding these programs. It was the other parts that were doing the fraud and abuse and other things. And so we, if you just we just had to keep on top of it. And you know, in a in a uh, respectful and politically correct way, say, here's what the re here's what you're really asking us to do. When we look at what the security requirements are and what you're asking us, the kind of data you're asking us to host, we have a third of the Medicare claims data in the United States here, a couple hundred terabytes of data. This stuff can't be lost. It can't be compromised without having to send you know beneficiary you know beneficiaries, Medicare beneficiaries, um, you know. Um, you know, uh, you know, provide them identity theft protection for a year if if we lose their data. Uh, we need to protect this data, and and here's here here are the real costs for doing that. Are you guys prepared to do that? And uh, uh, it seems like that's sort of the the practical side of cybersecurity is not. I mean, you can have the perfect technical solution, but if you're not able to package it in a way that is palatable to the the uh, the the financial side and the management side, it, it's not going to happen. Um, and it seems like to be successful to a certain extent, you have to not just be able to have those technical skills, but also the, the skills that are going to really market it and persuade people to, to get it implemented. Absolutely. So. And I think a lot of my job was to, um, uh, you know, build, uh, build friendships with program management, uh, to, be able to, to be able to go to battle with them and to say, you, you have a really successful program here, but you're not taking security seriously. You know, and in a, a you know, um, in a in a in a way that somebody who doesn't understand, you know, what a vulnerability scan, what a patch is, uh, program managers who are you know more like you know accustomed dealing with nurses and processing claims, you know, well, why should I have to patch these servers all the time? They they work fine. What you know, what what? Why do I need to do that? To be able to convince somebody who has a, an attitude like that of why you need to spend, why you need to have three or four IT people instead of one or two. To be able to do all this patching, and that's that that's a that's a difficult you know um, uh, position to be in, especially with dwindling budgets like we're happening lots of times too. So I think I was able to be successful in advancement, especially because we grew like we did. When when they were when their budget was increasing and we grew by two and a half uh, for several years, I was able to say, all right, you're going to add four or five IT people. We need to add a, a security body or two as well. Um, if they were shrinking or staying sag stagnant, and we would have had to say, you know, you need to take away a nurse or two and not do as much fraud and abuse detection and do more security. That's a lot harder of a job to sell that. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, and so fortunately, I wasn't in that position. I was be able to be in the position to say, all right, we're growing here. Let's grow security too. That's good. Yeah, and it made it a lot easier. So, so kind of uh, just. Changing subjects just slightly is you, you mentioned before that um, healthcare kind of lags behind in a lot of ways, and not just in sec security, but also just IT and other things. Um, 
then I actually had the opportunity to read a book called The New New Thing about um, Jim Clark, who was the founder of Netscape. And one of the things that he got in, he would look for these, you know, industries where there were billions of dollars of profits to be had. And the one that he looked to modernize first was the the healthcare industry, and with a company called Healthion, which I don't, I don't think it's around anymore. It's not around in the same form that it was then. Um, and that that was like ten years ago now, I think, or more, or fifteen. <clears throat> Has it, it, have you are you seeing that you know more and more it's it's catching up, or do you think there will be a point where healthcare is is uh, able to be on par with with other um, services, or even on par with the government? I don't know how those compare. Well, I think that um, the advent of newer technologies to do, um, you know, like massive, and I think you guys were talking about big data, you know, like uh, Teradata, I think, has a formidable infrastructure that CMS is now using to do a lot of the uh, data warehousing for a lot of their Medicare claims and to look for a lot of the, the fraud and abuse and uh, um, different types of um, pattern matching like, like Advanced Med was doing. And we were doing it with SAS and a couple other uh, flat file type, you know, highly indexed every row, every column uh, in these, you know, uh, type databases were, were, were indexed um, to be able to, you know, take a long time to build these databases, but really, really quick queries to get out and to answer the kind of questions uh, that, the, um, that, that the analysts needed to have answered. I think with the advent of technologies that can help them answer those questions quicker, I would think that nowadays they're finally starting to realize that, you know, this investment is really going to, if we invest in some of these technologies, this is really going to, um, it's easier to make the, the cost-benefit analysis based on the, the kind of tools that you have and the reasonable price tag that some of them had. You know, in, in the past, you'd, you know, you'd have some solution that IBM would come up that might cost you, you know, $100 million or something like that when, you know, today you can probably get something for, a fraction of that um, that you can install on, you know, some some VMs in in your typical, you know, uh, internally hosted cloud. So that's and not have to get proprietary hardware and, and the big iron like you used to have with IBM in the past. So I think the the cost point is getting to a point, getting down to a level now that it definitely will um, give rise to them adopting the technology a little more quickly than than they have in the past. Yeah. And and can you speak to in terms of you know you're talking about the database performance and being able to index quickly? Do you have any um, insights into whether or not data at rest and making databases behave with data at rest in a performance efficient manner is that something you guys have looked at or is it a challenge? And have any third party um, kind of products or services been involved in making that uh, lesser or more of an issue for agencies? Um, I mean, I think certainly a lot of the tools that, that we used at Advanced Med were, were focused, they were very healthcare centric, so they had um, a ton of algorithms already written for, for example, you know, get me all of the claims of this type uh, that, that show, you know, anomalies related to the, the, the use case that I talked about of, uh, you know, a bunch of MRIs, you know, 15 MRIs a day within a, a, a very small window of time. Or these services uh, being uh, granted without any underlying uh, treatment of care that would be relevant to those types of services. Sure. Um, and if you do that over, and not, now you're trying to do this, for example, for the entire state of California with billions and billions of claims over a, a two-year period of time. You can't do that with your typical normal hardware, and that's where I think having highly indexed, uh, super high performance, big data type, you know, um, uh, you know teradata type, and you know, platforms is really given rise to you know, some investments by you know not only the government but you know companies who are acting on behalf of the government that are smaller in size, like I was working for, because they can really answer those questions like the government wants to get answered. Yeah, and I mean, also just in terms of data storage, I mean, I imagine that it just the just the price per hard disk in terms of density has changed so much in five years. I can't even imagine the difference in investment for storage in you know 2008 to 2013. I think 
you know, in 2008, it was like the cool thing when two terabyte drives were just becoming available on the market. You know, now we're saying that equivalent for six terabyte drives, and those are actually somewhat affordable. Um, and you can go on Newegg and pick up a three terabyte drive for a hundred bucks, um, which I don't think we saw happening as fast as it did. And I think that's gonna, I think that's gonna expand and burst again. And five years from now, we'll be talking about you know eighteen terabyte drives. Right. Um, yeah, well, you know, there's an interesting thing that we had some of these, the, some of the data warehouses that I talked about that were took forever to load. Some of the jobs we had were several weeks to load, and this was a typical. Um, you know, enterprise infrastructure where you had, you know, all your your array of CPUs, you know, connected by you know dual NIC Ethernet, or if if we were lucky to have uh, fiber channel type arrays going to you know your your large data storage, and it would just take us weeks and weeks to be able to load these massive amounts of data, um, and so we kind of went backward and said, well, and this was all SaaS, and uh, SaaS said, well. Uh, Sun is making these specialized devices um, specifically for SaaS, and they're self-contained, uh, 10 gigs of data, um, x86 architecture, but all running on, on you know, SaaS using Solaris and Unix. Uh, and, and, it, and even though it seemed like it was kind of going backwards because we weren't using our enterprise you know, infrastructure from this data center, and we were having basically kind of like your, your old school, everything on one box, um, that increased the performance tenfold. And so we went back to having a, a cluster of, you know, uh, 4U devices that had all, you know, CPUs, disk, everything communicating all within that, just that 4U device. Mm. And it increased the throughput significantly simply because the price point was such that we could buy 10 of these instead of invest in some EMC, you know, uh, infrastructure that, IBM or somebody else wanted us to go spend, you know, five million dollars on. So it, sure. there's a the kind of a cost benefit. You need to look at what technology fits your your price point at that point, at that time, and that's what we chose, and it and allowed us to you know cut this down from several weeks to six hours. That's and just one example. And so uh, for medical IT, is there do a lot of vendors converge around a certain um, set of I guess brand names in terms of uh, relational database types and file systems, or are people kind of picking and running with what they want to for a given contract? Um, I think it's highly dependent on the, the the type of data and if there are algorithms specific to that um, to, to that space. So, for example, there was a um, a tool called Data Probe. Um, uh, I think it was a company that was a subsidiary of uh, Reuters at the time called MedStat, that they, uh, um, highly proprietary database, it was the one that I talked about, it was pretty much all flat files, but every field and every table was indexed such that it was equivalently fast to do a, um, a query on any column that they had. And that's what we could never, we could never index because of the, the variety of different types of queries that people were going to look to do to look at mine all these different types of data. So this particular tool worked out great. Sure. Um, uh, other tools that are out there, I think like Teradata, seems to be one that a lot of companies like CMS or a lot of government agencies like CMS and others are adopting uh, because of its high performance nature. Um, but then there's other non um, for non structure unstructured data. You're finding a lot of other databases out there that are not SQL based. That folks are using, and I think uh, Ashton, that's like some of the work that we've been doing in our uh, the, the the technology center at, at SGT um, that give rise to folks looking at different tools like that. Yeah, sure. yeah, I know we're using a lot of NoSQL databases, and uh, our our other coworker Rohit has been pushing us to to try them um, to to get experience with them because he seems to think that's the the way it's going to go in the future with the kind of more unstructured data being able to fit in there. So um, it'll be interesting to see whether that's the case in, in other fields as well, well like healthcare. But um, it, it, for, for now, I think the established patterns with SQL are um, are working well enough that it'll take some time. But I think if for some of the unstructured types of data that we would like to search, whether it's um, you know uh, video or voice or different things like that, that's that, that sometimes you, you'd want to tag this 
and use some kind of unstructured, you know, NoSQL type interface to be able to um, to be able to store that data, but then somehow maybe merge that with a, a highly ind indexed infrastructure like I was talking about that you could use for the quick query. So there, there's got to be some you know convergence of these that you'd be able to get the um, the capabilities of both types of tools, um, so you can get the speed as well as the flexibility like we currently get today. Yeah, yeah. and a lot of times the NoSQL databases aren't necessarily uh, slower. They, they still have indexing and they still can configure on what fields they're indexing. So a lot of them optimize that heavily. So it's uh, we're not too far away from the uh, you know that being a reality. I think we might have lost Christian momentarily. We did lose but, uh, Christian. Yeah, he. I think he clicked the wrong button and away he went. Yeah. He'll come back in just a second. Ashton, as we uh, we kind of bring this in for landing, any any last little tidbits you want to uh, you want to pull out of Jay before we're done here? I think we uh, we we covered pretty much what I I. I I heard what I wanted to hear. Um, if there's anything else that you, you feel like you want to say, Jay, that would be great. Yeah, any final words, Jay? Um, sure. Uh, I think just the, the, the use of technology in, in a way that can, you know, obviously meet the customer's requirements, um, not break their budget, uh, and especially in, in, in light of all the security breaches we have today, uh, keep security at the forefront, uh, I think, is where you know, government agencies and companies are going to be successful if they pay attention to, to those three. And and as an SSO, if you can do that in a way that doesn't um, anger management and allows you to keep your job, then then that's even better. <laughs> Sometimes it's an unfortunate uh, casualty of war. The the uh, um, security officers are, are are some of the ones who end up taking the taking the hit. Uh, I think the CIO of Target was the was the latest. Um, but that's sometimes those are necessary evils, and that's got to happen. Um, but I think it's the guys who can can make all those things happen and keep their jobs are the uh, are the ones who are doing it right. You always wish you'd paid for it after the you know after the incident, right? You're like, oh, I wish I'd have paid for that. But right. you never know either, right? I mean, it is a it's this it's this um, balance between cost and effectiveness, and and we struggle at Gallup, of course. You know, we've got lots of data, and we struggle with that question every day. And so, when you were go back when you were talking about encrypting all your data at at rest, we have been kind of wrestling with that ourselves over the last couple of years, and have finally decided it will all get encrypted. So we'll be moving in a direction to encrypt all our data at rest as well, just for that protection of, of insider threat, right? You just never know who's going to grab that, and uh, and very few people will have access to those uh, those keys. So um, just one of those things that you have to do. Well, Jay, thanks for taking a few minutes out of your evening. Uh, it's you gave, up, uh, you gave up an hour and a half for us, and we always appreciate that, and, and thanks for coming in. Christian, we didn't give, Christian, we didn't give you a chance. Any, any last uh, words before we, uh, we bail out of here? Yeah, I just wanted to do, uh, ask uh, as, a, as a summary wrap-up question on kind of a scale of 1 to 10 where you thought, based off what you've seen so far, where you think the medical industry is in IT and how um, kind of how hopeful are you that those technologies are going to catch up in one direction or another as time progresses? Oh, geez, it's probably, um, you know, all over the uh, the board, depending on what particular area you're looking in. But uh, um, I, I mean, if you look at their capabilities and you use uh, Medicare.gov as an example, I give them a two. Uh, you know, with their lack of ability to stand up a website. Um, but I think uh, that there's other parts that CMS has done a great job with. Like I said, in 2012, they won the Cybersecurity Award of the Year. They they did as probably good of a job as any government agency in rolling out an enterprise infrastructure. Um, and I think now it's you know um, it's they just need to find a good balance there. Um, so, but I, I would I'd probably give them a good you know solid seven or eight. And uh, I think they're certainly on the uptick, uh, and they're they're starting to do the right things with investing in technologies, the stuff you see at CMS and other government agencies, they're thinking enterprise, they're, they're, they all, a lot of them have online tools to store your repository of system security profiles and information so you're not just writing documents anymore, you're, you're uploading this information all into a repository and generating SSPs and contingency plans out of these uh, online repositories. Um, that's some good leading edge type you know, technology solutions that I see, you know, um, healthcare and other government agencies doing that, 
that leads me to believe that they're that they're on you know on the way up to do the right thing. Sure. All right. Well, with that, we'll call it a wrap. And I want to thank everybody who came out to, to join us in the live chat room as well. It's always nice on a Monday night uh, to be able to get a, a, a handful or two handfuls, probably in this case, yeah. of, uh, of you guys out there and some really good questions. So we appreciate yeah, definitely. You being live in chat. Jay, thanks again for coming on. I appreciate it. Great to meet you. Hopefully we'll, uh, we'll run into you again, either here, there, or somewhere in between. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely. I'd love to join you guys anytime again. Great. And, and before we wrap, I just want to add that I'm officially declaring hashtag uh, Cyber Frontiers as a new hashtag I will be following on Twitter. So if you have something to say about the show or something just awesome in general, hashtag tweet to that, and I will probably get back to you. Also know that our Twitter campaign is well underway, and we are 496 followers from Crushing the Empire. If you oh, don't know what yeah. I'm talking about, you will know soon enough. So um, if you want to if you want to get out there and use hashtag Cyber Frontiers, you're going to be contributing to a noble cause. <laughs> and, and that is Christian passing me on Twitter. So that's, that's what that's all about. So... It's all good, though. It all promotes what we do here on Cyber Frontiers as well as uh, Home Gadget Geeks and everything that's going on on the Average Guy Network. I want to remind you, of course, uh, we have a tech scholarship fund that's available if you're interested in testing something out for us. And that might apply here. This really applies more on our Home Gadget Geeks show. It's all about gadgets. But Ashton's sporting a, a microphone and arm there that we purchased with the average... Oh, hold on. Uh, Ashton, let me, let me throw that over to you. Now you can show that off with great fanfare that uh, we purchased through the average guy a tech scholarship fund basically you just use our Amazon affiliate link at the average guy TV slash Amazon and uh, if you want to test something or we need something like this for our podcast we'll buy those and send it out to the host and uh, that's available just head out to the average guy TV slash Amazon don't forget if you're a new listener to this a bunch of new subscription options uh, just head out to the average guy TV slash subscribe and you can subscribe to video large video small the RSS and all the iTunes links are out there as well. There's no excuse not to get the show automatically now, so head out there and grab that. And then join us for the next program we're doing November 10th. But guys, I'll need to move that time around a little bit. Uh, again, I think I have a podcast in Australia that evening, and I don't know which time slot it's in, so we'll get that figured out and post that. The best way to know when the shows are going on is I always post them in the little Google Calendar widget out at theaverageguy.tv. So if you ever want to know what's going on, whether Home Gadget Geeks or Cyber Frontiers here or any of the stuff that we do on the network, you can head out there and grab it from that. We'll do it all again in two weeks. Thanks for coming out, everybody. Good night.